If you're like me, you may have wondered, what's the first wireless transmission ever made in human history? And what's the physics behind that? If you're not like me, you might still be interested. Let's head to my shop and find out. What I have in front of me changed the course of human history forever. This device allowed humans to communicate wirelessly for the first time ever across vast distances, instantaneously. This particular device is almost 123 years old. It still works to this day. But this isn't a history lesson. There's a lot of really interesting physics involved in this as well. So let's take a deeper look at that. All right, so in order to understand how this works, we're gonna start from the end and work backwards. In order to send a signal, we have to send out a pulse of EM radiation, light waves, radio waves. In order to do that, we have to send current through a large wire and an antenna. The way that this device achieves that is by using a spark gap. It takes 30,000 volts to break down for electricity to travel across one centimeter of air. This is about six centimeters. So that spark you're seeing takes 180,000 volts to generate. When that spark goes across, it sends a large surge. This would be attached to an antenna on a ship, and that surge would go through the antenna, and someone on the receiving end would have an antenna, and they would pick up this exact same sound. So they would pick up beeps. Short, long, in Morse code, which is how we first were able to communicate in telegraphs, which is across land, and transferred over nicely to wireless telegraphs at the start of the century. Okay, so the next question is, how are we developing such large voltages? And this is actually really interesting. This is from something called Faraday's law. So, what is Faraday's law? Well, Faraday's law says that a changing magnetic field inside a conductor will produce a current, a voltage. Here I have some different solenoids. Solenoids are just coils of wire that are wrapped together like this. It's often confused with an actuator, which is a solenoid with the device inside that moves, but solenoid itself is just some coils of wire, and I've got a magnet. I'm gonna put this magnet in, and you'll see I get a current. But, when the magnet stops, no current. When the magnet comes out, I get exactly the opposite current. And that's because this thing is creating its own magnetic field to fight this one. So as this magnet's coming in, it needs current in that direction to fight that. But then I stop moving it. So now the magnetic field's not changing, it's happy. When I pull it out, it needs to create current in the other direction to fight that change. So the field strength is increasing. It doesn't like that, it fights it. And then the field strength is decreasing. It doesn't like that, it fights that. And that is the fundamentals of Faraday's law. Side note, this is how we generate electricity, actually, a changing magnetic field with coils of wire, on a basic level. Now, there's two ways to create a magnetic field. One is by using a bar magnet, permanent magnet, and the other is by running current through a wire. I have an interesting demonstration we can take a peek at real quick about that. Here I have a loop of wire, so it's running through here and then down. So when I'm looking above, what I'm looking at is a wire that's running down. I'm gonna sprinkle some iron filings. So they're uniformly all around the wire. And then I'm gonna run current through this wire. Okay? And what you're gonna see is we get this circular pattern. Now what I have is a bunch of loops of wire. This is what's called a solenoid. They're all stacked up. Again, I'm gonna sprinkle iron filings. So now it's all around the solenoid, evenly distributed, as best I can anyway. And then I'm going to run current. Okay. And now what we can see is that inside the solenoid, we get a nice constant field that's pointing in this direction. I put my finger in the direction of the current here, thumb direction of magnetic field. So it's pointing straight through the solenoid. And at the end, it's still coming out straight. And then it starts to curl and have edge effects. So now we know enough to kind of get into some more detail here. When this field turns on, when this, when this solenoid turns on, this one fights that change and creates a very large EMF to fight it. But why does it then continue? Well, there's one other really cool piece of old technology here, and that's this little rocker switch right here. What's happening here is actually quite interesting. When this solenoid here turns on, it creates a magnetic field. We had discussed that. This is magnetic, so that gets attracted over. Well, when that happens, that breaks the circuit that turns it off. Well, when it's off, it's no longer attracted, so then it goes back. I have some slow-mo footage we can look at so we can see a little more detail of what's happening. And you can see in this footage here that this rocker switch is rocking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. 
Okay, so now we know when this switch is down, we're getting a rocking back and forth, which is causing this solenoid that's in here to turn on and off, on and off, and on and off. And just like that magnet we saw before, this one does not like that change of on, off, on, off, and creates a very large EMF for increasing strength and then decreasing field strength inside to fight that change. And that EMF is large enough to cross this spark gap, which then sends a signal out into the airwaves that can be picked up by someone with a receiver. This was the first time in history humans were able to communicate wirelessly, and therefore this was huge for marine applications initially, because before you could send signals across telegraph lines, across land, large distances instantly, but at the time, and this is early, 19, oh, early 1900s, late, late 1800s, when a ship went to sea, that was it. You didn't hear from that ship until it either made its port or it didn't, as soon as it went over that horizon. As a matter of fact, a model just like this almost as exact patent design was on the Titanic, and even though there was still a very large loss of life, it saved hundreds and hundreds of lives because they were able to communicate for the first time in what is one of the first SOS signals ever to say they needed help. Well, hopefully you found that interesting, dare I say maybe fun. Subscribe if you enjoy science content, if you want to see more. I also put up a lot of shorts, and remember, physics is fun. See you in the next one.